Thanks, everyone. Yeah, that's a perfect, because um, I always forget to record until like the middle of the first <laughs> or the second slide. Um, today's a, a fun talk, my first time giving this talk. So, um, you know, uh, there's going to be some hiccups in there. It's a the trace metal biogeochemistry and rock soil plant continuum and looking at mines and wines. It's it just rhyming and went well together. Um, we're going to be looking at two case studies, looking at a former mine and looking at some wines. Um, yeah, so I'll jump into it. Um, I'm a, I like to do everything. Um, you know, specialization is for insects. That's what I've heard. Um, so jack of all trade, uh, master of none, some say. But I, I study many things. I look at rocks, minerals, and soils. My background is in soil science. So as a soil scientist, you've got to understand plants their physiology, uptake, nutrient demands. Um, you have to understand where rocks and soils become, uh, rocks and minerals become soils. Uh, so you have to understand some geology. Uh, I look at human materials and human impacts uh, on those systems and also think about pollution because soils are big repositories of pollutants from humans. So my research spans it all. I do everything and I fake it till I make it. I'm not quite a hard rock geologist. I'm not a plant physiologist. I'm definitely not an engineer of materials, but I do it all. And you know, there, there's a great need for inter interdisciplinary people who can put together the story across boundaries. Um, so hopefully this story, these stories will actually highlight how knowing all these different facets of science come together to tell interesting stories. Okay, so with the first, uh, my background as a Jim mentioned is studying forest. So this is what uh, Mount Mansfield in Vermont looks like right now. Uh, but this picture is like 10 years old. Um, and looking at trees, rocks and soils and mountainous areas. That's what my background as a P in my PhD was on. So we have lots of cool soils in New England. We have these uh, spotosols, these bright white E horizons made from glacial till. That's that rubble at the bottom. Uh, we also have some more wet hydric, hydric uh, spotosols, and then we also have some very interesting soils. This is actually a blue sea horizon in which um, blue schist is weathering and turning into uh, soils, and these soils are uh, mantled with uh, glacial fluvial deposits, so you can have these disconnects. Um, it's very interesting, really cool. It's a very dynamic linkage of geology, the uh, chemistry of the system, and how they relate to trees. So there's lots of linkages in this continuum of how rocks turn into soils, and then soils feed vegetation, and then how do they feed back to each other with elemental cycling. Uh, and I look at it through the lens of metals. Um, there's lots of cool elements on the periodic table, as right shown here. Um, uh, but most of them are metals. So everything from your alkali and alkaline earth metals on the far left, like sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, all the way over to uh, mercury, and then even the bottom of P block uh, are metals. Uh, you have your metal loids like arsenic and silicon and such, but most of the periodic table are metals. Um, they, give up, they give up their electrons quite e easily, and they form these very interesting inorganic compounds. Uh, what's awesome about metals is that they tell two stories. Um, they are both essential for life so everything from uh, chromium and vanadium over to zinc, those are part of your um, enzymes and enzyme cofactors, making sure that your proteins fold properly. Uh, and then also you need your macro uh, alkali and alkaline earth metals for chemical signaling, uh, creating electropotential gradients to be able to send signals and create energy, ATP, and all that fun jazz. Um, you know, carbon and nitrogen get most of the love in biogeochemistry, but uh, I focus exclusively on metals because they're really cool and they tell different stories. Another aspect of uh, elements are is that they're toxic. Uh, if you have too much of toxic elements, then they can cause misfolding of proteins. They, can, uh, they won't send your electrochemical signals and they can cause many diseases and disorders. So toxic metals like mercury and lead uh, lead at one, it pretends to be calcium and doesn't send uh, signals in your brain. So then you have uh, those kind of neurological disorders 
Mercury can actually sneak into your brain, pass a blood-brain barrier, and cause misfolding because it substitutes for selenium, but doesn't quite have the redox morphic, uh, sorry, redox potentials as uh, mercury, so then it causes misfolding. Uh, so these metals are very important in lots of ways. So today I'm going to be covering both their toxic and a little bit of their nutrient aspects, mainly the toxic. So for the first story, we're going to be going into an, a former soapstone mine, which has lots of interesting ultramafic rocks. And uh, this paper actually got published this year. Uh, this project was led by uh, a graduate student that I worked with and several other undergraduates. Um, so it's published in the Journal of Environmental Geochemistry and Health. So if you want to get it all, um, you can check that out. Uh, if you send me an email, I'll send you a copy as well. All right, so let's jump into this. So there's a former soapstone mine um, just west of Springfield. Uh, normally, we wouldn't care about former mines unless they're undergoing acid mine drainage, but this is a special mine because it actually is within the Cobble Mountain Reservoir. And that reservoir is Springfield, Massachusetts main drinking water supply. So greater than 300,000 people are drinking water from this area, um, from this uh, reservoir that has this ultramafic deposit. So the left map, we're looking at uh, Blanford, and then we have the zoom in call out in uh, figure B on the right. And we can see a whole bunch of interesting rocks here. We have these bands of metamorphic rocks. We have these politic rocks. We have sulfitic schists. And then we have um, some uh, purple blotches of ultramafic rocks. Um, and these are all within the reservoir, uh, within the reservoir's basin. So when they weather, they release their metals and they go into the reservoir. All right, uh, I'm not a hard rock geologist. I'm somehow a professor of geosciences and never took uh, uh, petrology. So forgive me um, for I have sinned on this. So I'm gonna just muddle through this. Um, essentially what's gone on is that there's this ultramafic ophiolite. Uh, that's a $5 word that I hadn't heard until about five years ago. And an ophiolite is essentially where uh, this, this oceanic crust gets smashed and accreted onto the continent, the continental crust, and, uh, and then rather than being subducted. And that means it's bringing very interesting geochemistry that should have been subducted into the mantle onto the land. And as we have the rocks weathering on top of it, it then exposes the ophiolite for weathering. Um, this ophiolite is mafic to ultramafic lens. Um, it's some Devonian Acadian orogeny and which is formed and emplaced. Uh, yeah, and it uh, both has igneous and metamorphic um, properties. Okay, so we're looking at the soapstone quarry. Uh, and this is uh, just some LIDAR looking at the former quarry. It looks like a river, but it's really the river started draining into it. Um, and we have soapstone there. Uh, soapstone is talc. It was mined for talc um, and used for various uh, industrial processes. There's also some hornblendite. And then we have this actinolite uh, hornblendite. So we actually can go to the former wall of this Osborne soapstone quarry. It's still there. It uh, still has a whole bunch of interesting rocks that are exposed there. They stopped mining it because um, no one really needs soapstone. And then also there's a bunch of asbestos form minerals there as well. So it's not great to go and play with, but we did. Uh, also on the site, we have this huge talus pile. This talus pile is very large. It's like three, four stories large, um, very huge pile on the side of a slope. And there's lots of trees growing on there. So this is what's going on. And this is the lead author, Justin Mistakawi for scale in both of these. He's about five foot eight for scale. Okay, so essentially the primary mining was this three to five meter thick face of this massive serpentinite, uh, sorry, serpentine talc schist soapstone, essentially. And it's up to 10 meters in width, and it's been largely uh, cut out, and they cease mining there. So it's been uh, abandoned roughly since like the 1920s. All right, so the reason that we care about the soapstone is that, that uh, it has very interesting properties because it's an ophiolite. Uh, it's got cobalt, chromium, nickel, and manganese. And the question for this project is thinking about transport. First off, is the rock weathering and releasing these uh, trace metals? Are they getting into the soils and sediments? 
And can we start to constrain what's going on for export into the actual reservoir? All right, so let's get into some petrology. Uh, Justin Misakawi, uh, he's a petrologist. He led all the petrology. I won't even try and pretend that uh, I know what he did and how he did. But uh, this is some of the uh, actinolites that we had. This is a massive uh, actinolite with some um, asbestos form minerals in there as well. Uh, you can see actinolite and some chloride and magnetite uh, throughout there. These are thin sections that he made. Uh, you can learn more about that in the paper. Uh, he covered all the petrology. <laughs> so essentially, uh, the soapstone is a ser uh, serpentine calc schist, and it's interlayered with some chloride schist and some three ampable hornblendite. So where are the trace metals in the system? Uh, trace metals can be in all the minerals. You have some isomorphic substitution of trace metals into silicates, for example. But what we found is that most of the trace metals are uh, in uh, some magnetites. So here in panel A, we're looking um, at where magnetite is and actinolite and chloride as a primary matrix. Uh, when we zoom in, uh, we can see that there's lots of trace metals in there, like manganese, some uh, visible chromium in there. So there's lots of uh, trace metals within um, these high, high uh, concentration nodules, essentially, of, of magnetite. So here's another uh, example where we're looking at quartz, actinoline chloride. We can see, again, lots of trace metals in there, um, uh, manganese and chromium. I'm pretty sure that's not all silver in there. Uh, a little bit of sulfides or uh, sulfur in there. So lots of trace metals are being uh, uh, aggregated, essentially, in these nodules of uh, magnetite. All right. So um, as a soils person, I did the classic thing, which is just to uh, do some classic extractions. Uh, we, uh, cat or, uh, we looked at three different phases. We first looked at uh, bioavailable phases, which is what will, rather, what will readily come out of the rock matrix. Uh, we use a, a solution of 1 point, a 0 0.1 molar ammonium uh, acetate. So that's like uh, ammonium to kick off anything off the exchange site and acetate to exchange with any uh, weakly bound organics. Uh, we also looked at strong acid extractable. That's using uh, reverse aqua regia to essentially etch all the surfaces of the silicates. So that's a way to actually dissolve our organic compounds, which aren't really uh, prevalent in rocks. But uh, it can dissolve the magnetite, for example, which is just iron and sulfides. And then lastly, we, we looked at total rock concentrations using uh, x-ray fluorescence. So that's essentially zapping a rock sample with x-rays. X-rays come back out, and then you just um, look at specific um, bands or wavelengths that correspond with specific elements. And we look at their intensities to determine their uh, concentrations. For the bioavailable and the strong acid extractable, uh, we use uh, inductively coupled plasma, optical emission spectrometry, and inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry to measure that. We have lots of fun toys here at UMass. Uh, what we see here is that uh, chromium concentrations are actually pretty high. They're up in the thousands milligrams per kilogram. Typical rock concentrations are uh, about 100, maybe 200. So we have pretty high total concentration of chromium. Cobalt should be less than 20 milligrams per kilogram in rock. And we can see that uh, in the chloride schist, there's lots of cobalt. Uh, rock concentration for manganese were not exceedingly high. That's typically around 1,000 up to 4,000, 5,000 uh, milligrams per kilogram or parts per million. So that's not super high. Uh, nickel concentrations are about, let's see, 50 to 100 milligrams per kilogram. So uh, the chlorite, schist, and serpentine talc were very high in nickel as well. Uh, looking at the strong acid extractable, we see that very little of the trace metals come out of solution. Um, that's a good thing in terms of long-term weathering. We can use that kind of as a proxy for what's going to weather out over the next um, 20 to 50 years. Lastly, we don't even see blue bars for, um, for chromium, cobalt, and nickel, meaning that there's very, very little bioavailable um, uh, nickel, cobalt, and chromium in the rocks. But we see a little bit of bioavailable manganese in the serpentine, uh, serpentine talc and the hornblendite. Okay, so at the Osborne soapstone, uh, soapstone quarry, we also collected some soil samples. 
We collected some upslope soils and sediments. So that's before things go into the quarry. Then we sampled soils um, and sediments within the quarry. And then we also sampled soils uh, downslope. And that the goal of that is to look at what is the sediment transport of trace metals, and then what is the soil storage or potential movement of trace metals. So that involves some undergrads. This is a picture of Ivan Shenko um, in my lab. Um, we dug a lot of soils. Sorry, Ivan, got blocked out. So these are young soils. These are inceptosols, uh, not strong horizonation, but we do see a nice uh, force floor uh, developing. Uh, and then within the mines, we actually have very poor drainage because essentially the mines have kind of backfilled and they don't really drain very well. So we do see some redoxymorphic features in the bottom. These are uh, golf tees for scale. So they're, you know, they're like three, four inches. So they're not that big. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a scale bar in there. But we actually have a pretty deep A horizon, lots of organic matter and uh, forest floor yet again. Okay. So uh, we're going to jump to cobalt and chromium, looking at soils. Uh, the soils, again, have pretty high chromium, uh, sorry, cro cobalt and chromium. Uh, well, really mainly co cobalt, excuse me. Uh, in the total fraction, when we look at the strong acid extractable, it decreases. So that's a good sign. That means that there's not a lot of cobalt that's going to be leaching uh, into the soils over decadal long uh, weathering. And when we're upslope above the mine, uh, cobalt is actually um, pretty low and getting toward what normal concentrations would look like. Now jumping to chromium, we do not see high amounts of chromium in the total fraction. The bioavailable fraction of cobalt and chromium are pretty much negligible. Um, yeah, and then strong acid extractable chromium concentrations are very typical. So we're, fe we're feeling, feeling pretty good that these soils are not super contaminated with um, these metals. Uh, so yeah, soil chromium is not elevated. Soil cobalt cro uh, concentrations, they're above these like uh, EPA screening levels of 13 milligrams per kilogram, which is parts per million. That's super low. Um, but when you actually think about animal toxicity and animal chronic toxicity, there uh, 230 uh, milligrams per kilogram is where you start to see those effects. So we're, we're below that. So even though like we might see some plant toxicity, uh, overall, we don't see that. And when we're thinking about trees in, in the Northeast, uh, all the trees there appear very happy. We don't see any, uh, any uh, signs of chlorosis or any kind of diseases stemming from toxic metal concentration. So we're feeling pretty good about uh, cobalt and chromium. So going further with um, nickel and manganese now, uh, nickel concentrations upslope, pretty average, nothing to write home about. When we get into the within the mine and downslope, um, a little bit higher in total concentrations, but not super duper high. So we might have some issues with some, um, you know, specific plants and uh, having some toxicity issues, but uh, overall we don't see that. Uh, the strong acid extractable very low overall and bioavailable negligible. Uh, manganese concentrations are all within typical soil concentrations, so we're not too worried about that either. So um, nickel concentrations are above the plant toxicity threshold of 38 milligrams per kilogram according to the EPA soil screening guidelines, but not above our animal toxicity of 210 milligrams per kilogram uh, for nickel. So we're again feeling pretty happy about that. Soil manganese concentrations were above plant thresholds. I don't know where they come up with these plant thresholds. I think that they're really looking at like row crops because 220 milligrams per kilogram is pretty low. Um, when the EPA uh, screening for animal toxicity is 4,000 milligrams per kilogram. That's what we normally think about for toxicity and we're way below that. So overall, these soils are very happy. We don't see anything toxic in the soils overall. Okay, so this is just looking at um, some of the, uh, um, the streams that are the feeding in and feeding out of the mine. They look roughly like this. There are these pretty strong indentations where they were probably made by the uh, people mining. They're, they dug these out trying to follow the ophiolite um, uh, ultramafic deposits and were unsuccessful and then they just left them there. So these stream channels are definitely not what we'd expect uh, geomorpho uh, geomorphologically, but I'm not a geomorphologist, so don't believe me. Okay, so we collected some sediments there. Looking at these sediments, cobalt concentrations, not super high. Chromium concentrations, not high either. 
Nickel, total nickel is getting a little bit elevated, but nothing to write home about. Manganese is also pretty, uh, pretty safe concentrations. So the sediment concentrations don't look like they're toxic and nothing is bioavailable. So that means that we don't have any like immediate sense of toxicity. So that's really good overall. So lastly, we sampled um, some stream flow. This is um, what we can see here in the bottom right of the picture. We're looking at the stream going out of the uh, mine area and into the reservoir. So this is Cobble Mountain Reservoir. Uh, this is uh, undergraduate Trevor Makoviak and uh, sent him to go sample some sediments in the rain, which is <laughs> poor dude. Uh, so we looked at stream flow both in spring conditions and summer conditions. During spring, uh, we have spring melt and also that year we had a lot of precipitation. So we had some pretty high flow events going on. Um, this is just an illustration showing where stream flow is going into the reservoir. Uh, high flow concentrations were very low. Uh, we're much below the EPA secondary drinking water standards for manganese and chromium. The standard for manganese is 50 uh, micrograms per liter or 50 parts per billion. Chromium is at 100 parts per billion and we're well below that. We're less than two overall or less than five for sure. Uh, and look at the World Health Organization, we're much below those as well. So under the high flow conditions, we're, we're very low in concentrations. Unfortunately, this is not gauged at all, and um, it's pretty uh, rough terrain and doesn't have a good flow, so it's tough to gauge necessarily the export overall. And also, I'm a soils person, I'm not a hydrologist. Um, so I don't have a good uh, constraint on total exports during spring. All right, um, so we were able to look at what's going on as well during the summer. Summer went very low, so fortunately we did have um, low flow conditions where we can actually stick a, a bottle and actually measure the flow rates uh, and it was less than one liter per second. Um, this, this V notch here was filled completely during spring and now it's completely uh, dry. During summer though, when we have low flow conditions, we start to see uh, higher concentrations. That's because of the concentration discharge dilution effect when you have um, I mean, I don't have the data to prove this, but essentially when you have more water flowing, you can then have dilution effect. And if you have less water, then uh, elements can be more concentrated. And we actually see some of the elements actually uh, increasing and heading towards some potential uh, high concentrations. So manganese starts shooting up, that's an orange, going up toward um, 50 uh, micrograms per liter when you get outside of the mine. So upslope is very low, but once you get inside the mine, we start seeing manganese getting into the export water. Uh, nickel also increases and nickel goes up toward 45-ish uh, micrograms per liter. So that's actually getting uh, toward the World Health Organization drinking water guidelines at which is set at 70 micrograms per liter. Um, chromium remains low and cobalt remains low. So that's, that's pretty decent. Um, but uh, unfortunately, we start to see a spike in, uh, in nickel and manganese related to the mine under low flow conditions. Okay, so just to wrap up the mine before we go to wines, um, total and strong acid concentrations suggest that weathering of uh, these uh, mafic and ultra mafic mine spoils and um, the mine itself is releasing some trace metals, but they're nothing really to be worried about at this point. Uh, we want to try and constrain potentially in the future, like what is the total export to this reservoir, but overall soils and sediments and stream waters do not show high chromium cobalt um, overall. Oh, that was out of order. Uh, <laughs> cobalt, chromium, nickel, and manganese, uh, they're concentrated really in these accessory grains. Um, they're really in these amorphous magnetites that are in. That's what we saw with the SEM EDS, which is scanning electron microscopy electron dispersive spectrometry, uh, spectrometry, and then also using electron microprobe analyses. We've got lots of toys here at UMass. <laughs> um, sediments and soils show limited bioavailability, demonstrating negligible imminent hazardous uh, conditions for terrestrial ecosystems. Um, if I just flash back real quick to this picture, uh, I can't see the picture. There's lots of trees growing on the mine. So we're not too, too worried about toxicity to, to plants. Like this is not some super fun site where we can't even get plants to grow. All right, uh, and lastly, stream water concentrations were well below drinking water standards, but we do have to keep an eye on manganese and nickel uh, 
um, in the future. And this was pretty fun. Uh, this is published in Environmental Geochemistry and Health. Uh, could send out that um, that proposal, or sorry, that um, that paper to everyone. And then also, I was very happy to send this report to the Springfield, um, the city of Springfield. They let me, they gave me the permission to go on here. These lands are, or those, that watershed is protected. They have police patrols there. So we were able to get the permission to go there and, and collect samples. Yeah, cool. Oh yeah, actually, before we go, the, Go any further. Um, I have this in my office. Like it's really cool. This uh, <laughs> this actinolite. Uh, this is all coated with some um, uh, with a clear sheen on it to prevent all the asbestos form minerals from flying out. But it, it's pretty cool. Keep it in my office. All right. Now to the fun stuff. Uh, so as a geochemist, we're always trying to validate our existence and get funding. And uh, what better way? To do that, then to justify our existence with uh, how we directly can understand things that impact human lives. So I was searching around at the bar, thinking about projects to do, and um, I'm not a wine drinker, but you know, there's lots of wine drinkers out there. And I was like, you know what? There's probably some relationship with metals and wines that I can try and uh, create a project out of. So let's go for something there. So. Uh, I don't know if any of you are wine people, so my apologies in advance for um, making fun of you all, but they love to say terroir. So can you taste the wine and the earth in there? And terroir literally is the characteristic taste and flavor imparted to a wine by the environment. Uh, terroir, they like to say you're tasting the earth in your wine. That terroir is the climate, so how wet or dry it is. Um, the topography is a very wet or a very dry part of the, of the land. Is it the soil? Does the soil hold a lot of water or is it very dry? Uh, you know, what kind of flora and fauna do you have? And then lastly, your grape type and grape variety, those all impact the terroir. Because essentially, um, if you have a grape plant that's very happy, puts out a lot of leaves, uh, then you're not going to get very good grapes for wine. You want a grape plant that has been beaten up, not a lot of water, not a lot of nutrients, you want them stressed out. That creates their tannins and phenols that create the body of wine in terms of their flavors and um, notes that they have. Uh, so you can actually get into the geochemical terroir. So there's actually a pretty interesting body of literature that spans food chemistry to geology and geochemistry, analytical chemistry. Um, first off, is there an elemental fingerprint of wines uh, from the protected designation of the origin of Valencia? Uh, you can see that throughout the body of literature in wine geochemistry is that they want to say we can actually tell where this wine came from based upon the elements in the wine. They want to protect their wine. So Valencia, Champagne Valley, uh, the Bordeaux Valley, they want to have a fi uh, signature of the geochemistry of their wines. So if anyone tries to bottle anything else, they could test the elements in the wine and say that that is a lie. That's one of the, uh, the main reasons that there's such a body of literature on this. The next, uh, similarly with uh, Papi et al, uh, they're looking at the relationship of geochemical elements and soils and grapes as a terroir. Can you tell different vineyards apart? So if you have one vineyard that makes a very high quality product, then you have another one next door that makes a lower quality product, can they just dump their stuff into a different bottle and can you tell that? So uh, there's lots of interesting questions about what and wine. So this is from Pepita et al, 2017. Uh, essentially here, we're looking at non-dimensional space. Uh, we're looking at F1 and F2. If anyone is familiar with linear algebra, essentially you're using eigenvectors and eigenvalues to non-dimensionalize and spread out the data. So you can have many, many variables, but you're looking at the variability in the data set and where does the variability come from? And essentially, uh, this is what this ordination plot on the right is looking at. And we can see all the elements are kind of roughly grouped together, except for magnesium, strontium, and calcium. Uh, and using this uh, non-dimensional area, you're able to actually separate wines from different locations. So the Botazzo and the Nardin and the Pettarello, I don't speak Italian, and Centroids, they all have different, they have different geochemical signals and you can actually map it out through, into space. So while they're doing this project, I'm looking at this, these elements in here. I was like, wait, you have cobalt, chromium, 
uh, you got zirconium, rubidium, like why do you have all those elements in your wine? And you don't actually publish the concentration. So I'm very curious about what's going on in the wine geochemically. So that then led me down another rabbit hole of toxic trace metals. And you can actually, there's this interesting study by Crystal et al. Um, they were looking at toxic metals at different stages of winemaking. So it might not just be the terroir that they love to tout. It might actually be how you treat the wine when you're uh, undergoing the viticulture. This is in uh, Acta Chimica of Slovenia, I think. Uh, and this is what's going on in their study. Um, if you ever make a graph, never make a 3D graph there, unless you really, really need to. There's, you know, there's no reason to ever do that. But essentially, we're looking at lead at, in the micrograms per liter. Um, that's parts per billion. And essentially, the key thing here is that many of the wines are above US EPA drinking water standards. So the BW is your final bottled wine, and it actually is above your EPA drinking water standards, even though your young wine and your material that goes into ferment it actually has pretty low lead concentrations. So there's lots of interesting questions going on here. All right. So that brought me into this question, are trace metal concentrations in wine important for human health? You know, trace metals aren't always bad. They can be micronutrients, but they can also be toxic um, if elevated or if they're just simply ones that you don't need for your metabolism. Um, so first off, uh, I looked at some wines. Um, I bought several mass produced white wines, some Chardonnay, Vignoles, Riesling, Sauvignon Blanc, uh, Pinot Grigio, and a Moscato and I, I digested them for analysis. Um, this is why it's really in food chemistry and analytical chemistry. Uh, wines are not things that you should give your ICPMS. It will get drunk in a bad way because the sugars will clog things. They'll get all your lenses dirty. Um, there are lots of alcohols, sugars, tannins, phenols that can um, really muck up your instrument. And also they can affect your uh, elemental measurements. So I um, pioneered this digestion process. Um, and this is something I hope to someday publish with the, the undergraduate that did all the work. Uh, it, essentially, we took 100 milliliters of wine. We did this in, um, with five replicates. And then we digested it with 150 milliliters of hydrogen peroxide. That's to destroy all the sugars and, and all the alcohol and tannins and convert that all into CO2. And then we acidified that uh, with nitric acid and then dried it down to 20 milliliters to concentrate it to help us with analytical resolution. Um, so that's a fun uh, digestion process. Um, so here's the suing part. Um, when you start publishing stuff, you can get sued. Uh, um, that's always a danger. So all these wine names are, um, they're not the true names, but if you're a wine drinker, you may know them. So here we have um, Barren Foot, we have Stutter's Home, Crane Pond, Clothed Grape, Purple Tail, Rock Cellars, Black Horse, France C, Stonebridge, Good Terra, and the Buddha Box. Uh, and here we're looking at macro elements. Um, our, uh, aluminum is really low concentration. Iron's pretty low. Um, they're less, or you know, less than three uh, parts per million or milligrams per liter. Calcium is getting up there. Uh, here's potassium, um, magnesium, and manganese. Manganese is pretty low. So I just threw up your daily recommended milligrams of some of these elements. Of course, you, your body doesn't need aluminum, but it needs iron, calcium, potassium, um, magnesium, and manganese. So if you were to drink one liter, you'd get this many milligrams. So if you drank one liter of this barren foot Pinot Grigio, you'd about hit your daily recommended uptake of manganese. Uh, I highly recommend that there's other ways to get your nutrients than drinking wine, but this is just something to throw out there. Um, that it can be an interesting source for some of these trace elements. Uh, sorry, these are macro elements. Now let's look at the trace elements. Okay, so now I've actually moved away from some of these, uh, your daily recommended nutrients to EPA drinking water standards and your well, well, World Health Organization drinking water standards. And unfortunately, I found a lot of arsenic in them, um, one to 22 uh, micrograms per liter. And the recommendation is 10 for the EPA and one for the World Health Organization. Copper, you can actually drink a lot of because it's a central micronutrient. So they put it up in the you know, many thousands. So we're nowhere near toxicity for copper. So you might be hitting your uh, daily recommended dose with, with that. 
uh, we found a, a good amount of lead there. So lead ranged from two up to 17 uh, micrograms per liter. Um, so that's at or exceeding your World Health Organization or approaching it for some of these and uh, exceeding some of your EPA drinking water standards. Um, What's not shown here are the error bars because this is a lot of graphs and you know like rule number two of giving a talk is to don't throw up a table of a lot of data but i wanted to give you the exact numbers um i, I don't have any more tables after this i promise uh chromium is up there that's um you know getting up there you know what's at 27 all the way up to 171 uh, micrograms per liter and then nickel as well getting a lot of nickel so the EPA doesn't have a drinking water standard for nickel. So again, we have to rely on the World Health Organization for nickel and it's below that. Um, but uh, yeah, nickel is a cent, I, I believe it's essential. Yeah, it is definitely essential for animals, but eventually you get to toxic levels, especially if you drink a lot of wine, potentially. All right, so we looked at a bunch of geochemical terroir and how does that actually relate to soils? Um, obviously I couldn't go to, uh, uh, I forgot what I called these <laughs> wineries, but um, you can't go to them. They're mass producing and you know, you, you're just mucking around. So I was able to go to some of my uh, smaller local uh, wineries to do some testing. So I went to five vineyards and they let me actually sample all their soils. So I actually sampled one in Virginia. So the first one is in the Finger Lake region of New York. I sampled a vineyard that's sitting on top of uh, shale. The next one is in uh, Vermont on Lake Champlain region, on the Grand Isle. Um, there, Argelite is the main bedrock there and it's a Chardonnay. Uh, I'm from Southern California, so it's very easy for me to go down the road from where my parents live still and sample the Tobacco Valley and San Diego County wines, which are derived from granitic alluvium. And it's a Chardonnay that's growing there. And then I went over to Shenandoah Valley and looked at uh, this winery on granitic alluvium and they're growing Chardonnays there. So I looked at the five vineyards. So here in California, we've got two in Southern California, Vermont, Finger Lakes, and then uh, Shenandoah Valley. So just a little show and tell. Uh, so beautiful there in central New York. This is overlooking one of the Finger Lakes. Went there, sampled soils and plants there. Um, now we're going to a colder uh, region uh, in Vermont. Um, very cold there, Lake Champlain. Again, we're able to grow uh, grapes there. Uh, this is Southern California, where it's Mediterranean climate, so very dry. We don't see any trees. Um, we got you can actually see big outcrops of uh, granitic. Uh, oh gosh, what is it? The batholith? I forgot what it's called. Anyways, they're old volcanic stumps there, and uh, as they weather away, they provide the prepared material for uh, for growing wine. And then here in the Shenandoah Valley, very beautiful, uh, humid, temperate, as you all know, but a little more inland than where you are. So each, at each of these wineries, I sampled soils, grapes, and wines. Um, I had to buy the wines. I didn't give them to me for free. Uh, I dug three to six soil pits throughout the fields. I uh, sampled six to 12 plants uh, for both their leaves, vines, and the grapes. I won't be presenting any of the, the leaf data, but we'll look at the grapes and wine data. Um, and I only discussed some of the trace metals today because I know this is already getting pretty long, the talk. All right. So first off, looking at the soil, um, we're looking at total soil concentrations. I use a hydrofluoric acid digestion rather than x-ray fluorescence, simply because the concentrations are too low to get very accurate measurements. Um, and then we looked at the exchangeable soil concentrations, again, using the uh, ammonium, uh, this time using ammonium chloride uh, as exchangeable uh, fraction. We can see that very little copper, very little zinc, very little arsenic, very little lead is actually exchangeable in soils. Uh, we have more exchangeable as a fraction of arsenic than the other trace elements. And these numbers are for each vineyard. Um, yes, three and four are California, five is uh, Virginia. These are Vermont and the Finger Lakes, I've already forgotten. Uh, let me flash back. Uh, okay, one is Vermont. Oh, oh, that, that's not good. Okay, two is Vermont, one is Finger Lakes. Sorry about that. Okay, great. All right. So we saw that the soils have, uh, sorry, I should probably explain. Soil arsenic concentrations are pretty average across the different vineyards, um, you know, ranging between eh, like four all the way up to like 18 milligrams per kilogram. So that's not exceedingly high. And most of it is locked up in some in exchangeable phase. Uh, 
Uh, lead concentrations in the vineyards are very, very low. Um, average crustal abundance of lead is somewhere between 50 and 70 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, zinc is actually very low as well, and copper is actually very low as well. So these soils are not contaminated. They don't have very high trace metal concentrations. Um, looking at what's in the vines and grapes, uh, here in the Finger Lakes, very, very little copper, very, very little uh, arsenic, very little zinc. Um, lead, surprisingly, is uh, rather constant across the different vineyards. Um, so the orange or uh, peach-ish color is what's in the vine, and then the green is what's in the grape. So if the concentrations are higher in the green than the, um, and the grapes than the vine, that means that grapes have higher concentrations and are either accumulating or have received them for some reason. But if they're the opposite and they're lower, that means that there's low transmission. Um, so here for uh, vineyard two and five, we see that there's low transmission, but here we can have some kind of like chemostatic transport across the vines to grapes. Uh, we see a little bit of decrease and a little bit of increase for arsenic, very interesting. Um, so why could these metals be in grapes? Um, oh, actually, I'll say that. I have a, I have to describe that later. Sorry. All right. Lastly, uh, as a good geochemist, you get to realize that concentrations are not the best way to understand stuff. So it's very important to take some ratios. So here we're looking at wine grape ratios, where essentially we took the concentration in the grape and divided by the concentration in, sorry, the concentration in the wine divided by the concentration in the grape, excuse me. And that means if it's higher than one, that means that there's more metal or higher concentrations in the wine than in the grape. But if it's less than one, some fraction of less than one, then that means that there's much higher concentrations in the grape rather than the wine. That means that we don't have a very effective transmission from the grape to the final product. And what we can see here is that we have like a, um, you know, a 5% transmission rate-ish from, uh, from the grape to the wine for lead. Uh, we have much lower transmission, so less than 1% transmission of arsenic in the grape to the final wine product. Uh, again, uh, look at the uh, copper, low transmission overall of 1%, but we see actually a higher concentration in the final product. Um, and similar with zinc, we see greater than one uh, wine to grape ratio for zinc. So that's very interesting. That's saying that there's some kind of input while most of the vineyards are not uh, tr having high transmission of copper or zinc from uh, grape to wines. Now that's all dandy, but what does that mean for toxicity for these trace metals? Uh, so unfortunately the arsenic uh, concentrations above the one part per billion concentrations um, for the World Health Organization for arsenic in wine across all of them, even though they're very low transmission rate, we're still getting enough transmission of arsenic from the soil to the vine, to the grape, to the wine. Lead, we only see a couple spikes where they're approaching um, the EPA standard of 15, uh, uh, 15 parts per billion, but uh, they're actually for two of these vineyards above the uh, World Health Organization drinking water standards. Zinc and copper, are much, uh, they're very, very low, so they're much below the uh, drinking water quality standards. So unfortunately, uh, you know, wines, beers, other products, they're not under the same guidelines as, the, say, the um, EPA's drinking water standards. They fall under regulation from the, uh, the FDA, Food and Drug Administration. So they actually are not under the most strict conditions for regulating what is in your wine, unfortunately, and especially if you go to a nice boutique wine. So that expensive wine is definitely less regulated what's in it. Okay, cool. So what are the potential sources for these trace metals? If they're not being transposed or um, uh, carried all the way from the rock to the soil, to the grape, to the vine, to the wine, um, you know, a lot of these metals are used as pesticides. Copper is a technically an organic way to kill insects. So of course um, they use uh, copper. Arsenic is, a, is an antiquated a pesticide that's no longer used, but it can remain in these soils, but we didn't see them in the soils. Um, so one of the other big uh, question marks is what happens when you have the grape versus what gets into the wine? Uh, first off, they can sit in barrels because all, all these wines are Chardonnays and uh, Chardonnays are, being, are pretty famous for being uh, aged in barrels. Uh, 
So that kind of equipment could release trace metals into the wines. Um, also, you know, one the thing I'm trying to sweep under, but I'll say it anyways because I'm unfortunately an open book, is that we don't have the uh, we don't have the numbers on um, how many pounds of grapes goes into how many pounds or uh, mass of wine. So there could be some concentration factors there that are not being taken into account. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, this, this study is still in its infancy, so there's lots of interesting questions here, and I don't want to get sued this early. Okay, so just to conclude, uh, mass-produced wines, uh, most of those were from California. They contain some high concentrations of toxic metals. Um, at the five vineyards, we see that toxic metals are not bioavailable, and even their total concentrations are very low. But somehow, we're able to concentrate it enough in the in the vines and in the grapes to still have transfer efficiency to cause uh, toxic concentrations in the wine. Um, so yeah, this might also be due to some of the other viticulture processes that are not covered in the traditional terroir. Uh, I actually measured what's in the glass. I didn't talk about it here, but those also have some metals as, as well. Okay, so with that, a um, lot of fantastic work with lots of great collaborators. Jaziel Chase uh, doing all the wine digestions, Justin Misakawi, Ivan and Trevor for doing all the, the mine work. So with that, I'll stop sharing screen and shut up for